Let's talk about smoother, safer, and just overall better landings of an airplane in six steps. Now, these aren't the only things. These aren't everything. But these are definitely some things that I've come across over years of flying, not only for myself, but in helping students safely and consistently land airplanes. Now, landings, as you know, are a critical phase of flight. In fact, 45% of general aviation accidents occur during this phase, so you need to get it right. Um, but it's also difficult because every single time, every single approach, every touchdown is just a little bit different. You want to have repetition under your belt so that you can rely on previous experience to help you in the present. Let me begin with tip number one, and that is to always have a stabilized approach. And the definition of that for me is an approach where only minor correction changes are needed to stay on an optimal descent path. The point here is that it's not like you're never going to be a little bit low or a little bit high or a little bit fast or maybe even a little bit slow. Yeah, you can be slightly steep, shallow, fast or slow, but so long as your overall approach and descent are stabilized and predictable, I think predictability is key. That to me is what determines a stabilized approach. If you're fighting laterally, if you're fighting vertically, if you're making huge power changes, and I'm not even talking about an instrument approach, simply a visual approach to the touchdown zone. If you're having to make large correction changes, think about what's actually happening here and let's second guess whether you want to proceed and try and finalize this landing. And if you want to continue flying that much closer to the ground. The easy alternative here, if things aren't right, if you don't have number one, this stabilized approach, go around and try again. Nothing to be ashamed of. It's not that difficult. Tip number two here is that these landings are all about energy management. As you descend towards the runway, there's always two things at your disposal, airspeed and altitude. And you can trade one for another here but they come with a cost. And for example, if you're looking for a quick altitude loss, it's simple. Steepen your descent. Point the nose down a little bit more. But understand what comes with that is increased airspeed. And same thing, if you're looking for a quick airspeed loss, you're trying to bleed some of that excess energy off, well, you're probably going to pitch the nose up a little bit. And all of a sudden, your descent turns into level flight or maybe even climbing and yes, you have reduced your airspeed, but now you've gained altitude. So there are trade-offs. Like I say, there is a cost for having one to help compensate for the other. These two things, airspeed and altitude, in addition to your gear and flap settings, right, which can also help slow you down. And remember, usually the first notch of flaps on a GA airplane are to help you with lift. And the next notches, one or two or three more, are to help you with drag, but all of those things can add in to slowing you down and getting you down safer and steeper maybe, um, but all of these need to be balanced in harmony. Simple as that. Let's move on to point number three here, and actually three things to talk about. The descent, the round out, and the flare. In that order. Now, these are three distinct phases of flight and transition, right? The descent your nose down, you're in that stable approach, hopefully not a lot of correction changes. Eventually, and you'll see this depicted in, in my next slide, you will get to the round out. This is where the airplane enters ground effect. This is where you neutralize that descent into more of level flight, just a few feet above the runway. And then all of this transitions into the flare, where you're not exactly doing anything different, only maintaining attitude, and to do that, you usually have to add more back pressure because you're slowing down. But the point is maintaining attitude and slightly reducing your altitude from, let's say, six to five to four to three feet to two feet, slowly to one feet. And that is the smooth landing that we're, we're aiming for here. And the flare is essentially helping the plane land itself. This is the pilot helping the plane land itself. More on that still to come. But the mistake here that I've seen way too often is to combine all three of these things into just one and have them kind of be sloppy and not defined. The goal 
And what I'm looking for, what I'm aiming for, is to produce and identify three distinct phases in this order and no going back. Essentially, you can't go from a descent to a round out to another descent to maybe the flare, but now you're still trying to round out. It has to go descent, round out, and flare in that order. And I think what's best when you can really see a student practicing their landings, working on their landings, or even a, you know, a, a relatively low time pilot who's still trying to master good landings, when they're able to verbally identify what they're doing, I'm descending, here's the round out, here's the flare, I'm holding it, I'm holding it, I'm holding it, touchdown. That's when you know that they know these three steps. Let's get to number four of six in just a second. First here, the graphic depiction I promised. These first two uh, airplane images on the top here are obviously part of the descent from 78 knots to slowing down to 70. Now, this is likely a Cessna 152 or 172 based on those, those target airspeeds. 65 knots is where you get into that ground effect right there. You're rounding out over the numbers, maybe just past them, aiming for that touchdown zone. And then 60 knots right there as that speed bleeds off. That's the flare. And you're simply holding that until the plane is ready to land itself. The bottom image here shows what's optimal. It's a slow descent. Right, You're not aiming to the runway and then a real stiff level out and then a flare. It's one gradual slow movement down to the runway, but eventually it does transition and then it transitions again and then you make your landing. And that near zero rate of descent is what's going to give you the smoothest, smoothest landings in the very end. All right, number four, as I said before, the plane is going to land itself when it's ready. Think about this. You should never, never force a touchdown to happen generally in normal operations. I can't think of a time where it makes sense that you want to slam this thing down on the runway. Maybe if it's rainy, wet conditions, a contaminated runway, uh, potentially if it's uh, very gusty and you're trying to make that just firm, safe, get me on the ground landing, or let's say you're landing on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> but again, under normal, most normal operations all things and elements considered, you don't want to force a touchdown. Generally, nothing good happens from that because you're too fast, you're too slow, you're out of that envelope of speed to land the airplane. And there's a reason that you're out of that envelope and you're not supposed to be landing that airplane. A go-around is probably more favorable. But what I'm talking about here, landing, having the plane land itself when ready, is for you, the pilot, in the flare to prepare the main gears, not the nose gear or the tail wheel, if you're flying a tail dragger, prepare the main landing gears for landing. And then, like I said before, maintain that attitude until touchdown is achieved. Now, as you know, the airplane is getting slower as you're maintaining that attitude. So to maintain it, uh, kind of like in slow flight, you have to add a little bit more back pressure to hold that. But it's a careful balance, right? Because if you run out of too much of that energy, you will simply drop out of the sky. You don't want to do that three, four, five, six, seven feet above the runway. But going back to the plane landing itself, one of the things I observed with students hundreds of times over, maybe even thousands, was that patience is generally your best friend when you're trying to make these smooth landings. Again, forcing the touchdown comes with being impatient trying to rush this, trying to get the landing process started and completed instead of just hanging on. And I'm not saying float halfway down the runway. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But don't force that airplane on the runway. It's generally going to land so long as you're holding it there and you're putting it in that position to make a nice, smooth, safe landing. It's going to take care of it for you. Fly it all the way down to the runway and just paint it on. And again, a stabilized approach is going to help you with your timing so that you're not going too fast. You're not having to flare for 45 seconds. And also so that you can hit your aiming point, which is critical in short field operations or situations where you need to get the airplane down on a certain spot of the runway. Point number five, and that brings me to this, airspeed in your descents and landings are everything. Target airspeeds are foundational. There's no question about that. Um, it's not to say that you need to totally fixate on the airspeed indicator. 
the entire descent and landing. At some point, you need to be outside. You need to be completely visual. But for most of the time in that descent, um, even over the numbers, and I really feel like over the numbers is a good last spot to take a glance at that airspeed. How am I doing over the numbers? If I'm close, there's really nothing else that you necessarily need to know. You can be outside entirely visual the rest of the way for this landing. But going back to how do you get that target airspeed, pitch and power always equal performance. Now, I did put in there with wind considerations because now you're not necessarily just talking about airspeed landing this plane. You're talking about ground speed. Do you have a huge headwind? Is it a wind variable, very calm and no wind, no surface wind, or maybe even a little bit of a push on the tail, which, you know, doable but not optimal depending on your situation. But all of these things considered, as well as, you know, how about just turbulence created by wind? That can make a, an approach a little bit less than stable occasionally. I can't tell you how many times I've fought it all the way down because it's a windy, turbulent day. But pitch and power generally are going to give you the performance that you want. When I say performance, they're going to give you that target airspeed that you want as you are a mile out, as you are 100 feet AGL, as you are over the numbers, and as you are flaring. Um, but going back to target airspeeds and that, that envelope of where you want to be, if you're fast, generally, runway usage is going to be an important, maybe even your main consideration. If you're too fast, how much runway are you going to use? Now, there's also the safety aspect of coming in too fast and then touching down, maybe losing a little bit of control um, once those two or three wheels are on the ground. That's definitely something to think about. And then on the flip side, controllability, maneuverability is one of the biggest considerations in slower airspeed flight and approaches, right? So you want to make sure that you have control of the airplane, but on the other side that you're not going too fast, out of control, like I say, and using a little bit too much more runway than, than you were hoping for, planning for, or that is even available to you. And certainly when I say controllability in these slow situations, I'm talking about, you know, maneuvering the air, airplane laterally in addition to flat out approaching stall speeds way quicker than you want to. You know, you think about power on a training airplane, it can come back pretty quick. You can develop that airspeed and that power and that thrust that you need. Just know not all airplanes are, are capable of, of helping you out. The timing is such that when you're trying to add that power, you're not instantly going to get it. There is going to be a little bit of a lag effect. Last thing here, number six, and I find this one to be more critical and more helpful uh, than most people even think about. And that is for a pilot to maintain an outside mental picture during landing, like during the descent, during the round out and during the flare and actually during the touchdown. Because while you're inside the airplane, the sight picture as you transition into completely outside the airplane, watching that horizon, you know, and your peripheral vision, that is all you have. In fact, I say it right here, the peripheral vision on the horizon is the most valuable perspective you have in landing this airplane. And a lot of people know that. Um, a lot of experienced pilots who might be watching this are saying, yep, I, I totally agree. If you're still in that learning to land phase, think about that peripheral vision a whole lot more than, than maybe you're doing right now. But the concept behind maintaining an outside mental picture is this. Pretend you're watching this landing from outside the airplane. Pretend you're watching from the ramp. Or pretend you're playing flight simulator. For some reason, for me, it always helps to think about what the airplane is doing from outside the airplane in addition to what I'm seeing inside. Right? I'm looking at that horizon. I'm thinking, all right, but how does this, how does my deck angle look from outside the airplane? Am I way nose up right now? Am I going to just drop when I run out of airspeed? Or do I have a little bit more play to hold this thing off, hold this thing off, touch the mains down, then slowly let the nose down? Something to think about, right? It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting and not widespread method of landing the plane. It's not to say take yourself out of the cockpit. It's to say, use that sight picture, use that peripheral vision in addition to an outside mental picture of what the airplane is actually doing. So final takeaways here, look, <laughs> as you know, in flying, specifically learning how to land, 
you can overthink all of this. There's no question about it. So take these bits and pieces that help you most. Number two is that safety comes first and then being smooth after that, right? I, I want number one, everybody to try and make this the safest landings uh, because the smoothness will come. Um, but you need to be, you need to be safe before you worry about anything else. Obviously, I hope that makes sense. Number three is take your time during and after an approach and landing. Um, don't rush to get down. Like I said, let the airplane land itself. Don't rush to slow down. No need to slam on the brakes generally or, you know, take the, take the fastest exit taxiway you can. Take your time, right? Don't rush this. You're going to feel in the moment like it's, it's human nature and instinct to get down, get it done with, get out of the way. But in reality, you're going to be better and safer to take your time and do this the right way. Because number four, your aim here is consistency. You are looking to be able to replicate safe, smooth, and better landings over and over and over. And like I said before, no two approaches and landings are, are generally ever the same. But what you can do in your mind is kind of build this database of what has worked before what tricks do I have up my sleeve and how can I apply it again here and now to this only landing that matters? Hey, safe flying. I hope this helped and I'll talk to you soon.